Hi, everyone. Uh, as Nia said, welcome to uh, today's lecture. Uh, so I'm Jared Simpson. I'm based at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, which is one of the host uh, sites of CBW, uh, where I run a research group uh, dedicated to developing bioinformatics methods for uh, processing genome sequencing data. And I sort of have a very wide view of, of the type of genomes that we're interested in. We do a lot of human genomes. Uh, we do a lot of cancer genomics. Um, but back in about 2015, I got started working on pathogens, particularly viral genomes, when I worked with Nick Lohman and Josh Quick on sequencing Ebola genomes directly in the field using uh, nanopore sequencing. Uh, and when uh, we started to do a lot of local coronavirus sequencing here in Ontario and Toronto, I got involved in developing some of the bioinformatics pipelines that we used uh, here in Canada. Uh, so I'm really happy to share some of that experience and uh, talk about uh, our work sequencing uh, viral genomes. Um, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible, so please feel free to ask any questions at any time. Just pop your hand up. Um, I'll try to uh, try to see that and, and uh, pause for you to ask a question. Uh, if you prefer to ask in Slack, I'll keep an eye on Slack as well. Uh, but this is going to be sort of a broad overview of both the viral sequencing methods, but then focused on the analysis methods that we use to uh, turn uh, sequencing data into viral genomes. So if there's anything at all that you want me to cover in uh, more depth, do please feel free to, uh, to pop your hand up and we'll try to uh, try to cover that. Okay, so uh, let's maybe start at uh, usual place. We start uh, CBW, uh, which is going over learning objectives. So I'm going to start by taking you through the different approaches to sequencing a viral genome. Um, we can think about it in a lot of different ways, from targeted sequencing all the way up to sort of more metagenomics uh, approaches. Um, we'll tackle some of the issues of trying to sequence really low abundance viral genomes from real clinical samples like nasal swabs. Um, and then I'll introduce the idea of sequencing viruses using amplicon-based approaches and discuss the key steps for analyzing amplicon data and taking the data all the way through from raw sequencing data to uh, finished genomes that might be uh, used for doing things like phylogenetics, which Fiona talked to you about yesterday, or uploading into sort of global data sharing resources, which is really important for understanding how these large outbreaks uh, change and evolve. Uh, over the course of, uh, of say, uh, the outbreak of the pandemic in the case of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then in the practical section, you'll have a chance to uh, actually work with some virus uh, sequencing data and run it through the analysis pipelines we developed for the, the National Coronavirus Project, CanCoGen, um, and then perform some quality control on that data. And in the tutorial, I'll sort of expand on some of the finer points of working with uh, fairly large scale sequencing data and trying to automate some of the analysis will also cover how the individual tools work. All right, so uh, let's get started then. So maybe we can start to think about pathogen sequencing in, in sort of three different flavors. Um, so at the simplest uh, flavor is when you have samples that can be isolated in various ways, typically through culture, like when I think about culturing bacterial genomes like E. coli, and then the sequencing is pretty straightforward. You just do uh, you know, whole genome shotgun sequencing where the DNA is randomly fragmented, sequence the individual fragments, and then try to reconstruct uh, the fragments back into the genome, uh, like what Gary talked to you about in the de novo assembly uh, uh, module uh, in, uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, we can also think about doing more targeted sequencing where we might only be interested in a small region of the genome. So we design PCR primers to amplify that region to really high copy number and then sequence uh, those PCR fragments. Um, typically, you target your sequencing towards some sort of marker-based region of the genome, like 16S, where after sequencing, uh, you can identify uh, what that pathogen might have been. Uh, but often when we're doing sort of clinical sequencing, like in, in, in SARS-CoV-2, we're sequencing from what we call a complex mixture, where the thing that we're interested in, the pathogen, let's say the virus in this case, is only a fragment of the molecules from a much larger pool uh, of, of DNA or RNA. Um, 
And we can do this either directly with shotgun sequencing, where we don't bias it towards anything that we're uh, that we might be looking for, or we can design uh, different ways to either capture, deplete the stuff that we're not interested in, uh, or enrich for the things that we are interested in in various ways. But after you go through those capture deplete uh, depletion protocols, you would perform sequencing uh, as normal. So we can sort of put the different pathogens that we're interested in on two different axes. Uh, the amount of the pathogen that might be in our complex sample from either really, really abundant, high abundance pathogens to low abundance pathogens, and the diversity in the sample, uh, or sorry, in the target genome. So if we have something that's very, very slowly mutating, we would say that that's low diversity, whereas if we have something that's highly mutating, uh, that's a higher diversity, and we might need to choose a different way uh, of sequencing it. Um, the reason being that if we have low diversity, we can design PCR primers that will tile across the genome to give us a panel of amplicons that we can then sequence. But this strategy doesn't work very well to samples mutating really readily because you're going to get a lot of mismatches with respect to your PCR primer binding sites, and that will cause your amplicons to fail. So there you might choose a strategy more like probe capture, where you design bait sequences, where the RNA or DNA will hybridize to, and then you can enrich for those probes to sequence. And these sort of strategies work a little bit better uh, when there's really high diversity. On the other axis, if you have a high abundance of your pathogen, you might just do shotgun sequencing without trying to enrich uh, at all, or if you have low abundance, you'll probably want to amplify or do probe capture to enrich for those sequences that you're interested in. So things like HIV might be sort of in this quadrant where it's really high uh, diversity, but sort of moderate uh, abundance. SARS-CoV-2 is probably somewhere down here where uh, but diversity is somewhat limited or doesn't mutate all that frequently, although we'll talk to talk about the implications of mutations uh, in the genome a little bit later, but we can have really, really low abundance samples that we still want to sequence. And each of these different strategies, whether we just do whole genome shotgun sequencing, if we do probe capture, if we do amplicon sequencing, all have different constraints on them. So shotgun sequencing is the cheapest and the fastest. We don't need to do any sort of enrichment. So you can just pretty much put the DNA or RNA directly onto the sequencing sequencer after creating a library. And it's not biased in that we don't need any knowledge of what the sequence is. We can just directly uh, sequence those uh, samples. Uh, in contrast, for the amplicon-based approaches or probe capture, we need to know what the sequence is that we're interested in. So if you want to design PCR primers to amplify the whole genome in the amplicon-based approach, you need the genome first to, to figure out what the primer sequences should be. And you have the same constraint with probe capture where you need to know uh, the sequence so that you can design phase. And they also have different trade-offs and cost, whereas the amplicon approach is sort of medium in cost and time because you need time to uh, amplify the genome. Probe capture tends to be a little bit more expensive and take uh, a little bit longer. I'm going to just pause there. Is uh, any questions at this point about sort of the upfront sample processing before going into a sequencing library? All right, all good so far. Um, so I'm going to use uh, SARS-CoV-2 as sort of a case study of how we uh, implemented a large-scale viral genome sequencing project to sort of the national scale across Canada from coast to coast. Um, now, the reason we used an amplicon-based approach for SARS-CoV-2 is that it's a fairly short genome. It's about 30,000 bases. Uh, it's an RNA virus which means that we can uh, amplify the genome in a series of amplicons. So uh, early on in the pandemic, Josh Quick from the University of Birmingham in the UK uh, designed an amplicon panel uh, for SARS-CoV-2, which was called Arctic. It uses uh, two pools of 400 base per amplicons. The original version had about 98 amplicons that spanned from uh, one end of the genome to the other. So you would take a clinical sample, uh, convert the RNA to cDNA, amplify the two pools of amplicons, uh, merge the, the two pools together, make a sequencing library from it, and then uh, generate your sequencing results. 
So there's really two common Applicon schemes that were in use for SARS-CoV-2. There's what was called the Arctic scheme, as I just mentioned, which Josh created. Uh, it uses 400 base per Applicons. And then there was another uh, Applicon scheme that came out of New Zealand and Nikki Freed's lab called uh, nicknamed Midnight, which uses somewhat longer Applicons, 1,200 base pair Applicons. Um, there's a trade-off between the sensitivity uh, and the size of the Applicon. You can, uh, it's a little bit easier to amplify if you have shorter Applicons, so you can uh, potentially sequence lower abundance samples, whereas the longer Applicons are a little bit easier to work with uh, and to sequence. Anybody want to hazard a guess at uh, why we need to do two pools of Applicons? Like you do, you split the RNA or the cDNA into two pools, one that has one set of PCR primers, the other pool has another set of PCR primers. Anybody want to guess why we do that instead of just see, just amplifying all at once? Benjamin, I saw your hand first. Yeah, maybe a nanopore versus Illumina. So we're going to, yeah, so, so it's important that the, the sequencing technology that you uh, use is, is definitely uh, important. Um, we're going to come to that in a sec. And, you know, when you have shorter amplicons, um, you want to sequence from end to end. So you might want to use long reads. Uh, and especially with the 1200 base per amplicons, you can sequence the entire amplicon from end to end. So that's going to be an important consideration. But at this point, um, uh, I want to I want to address the question of why we do two different pools, regardless of how we end up sequencing the amplicons. Why don't we just amplify the whole genome in one PCR reaction, one big multiplex PCR reaction at once? Anybody want to make a guess at that one? Overlapping regions. Overlapping, yeah. Thank, thanks, Dinesh. So that, that that's the answer I was looking for. Is that we want if you have all of the PCR primers in one reaction you're going to have primers that uh, just make really, really short amplicons. We need the PCR primers to span every position of the genome. So the PCR primers naturally overlap and you would get these tiny little amplicons um, if you just try to do it as one reaction. So we need to have this tiling where there's space between the adjacent amplicons in one pool um, such that we get clean amplification of each base of the genome. Um, so it's sort of, this is one of the limitations of Applicon based approaches is that we need to do two PCR reactions. You split your, your cDNA uh, in two, but it's necessary to, uh, to make sure that you don't get little short Applicons instead of uh, the long Applicons covering every position of the genome. All right, so let's get to uh, which the, the issue that Benjamin just raised, which is uh, now that we've got our Applicons, how do we actually sequence them? And pretty much every sequencer that's available uh, on the market was used for SARS-CoV-2. Um, I'd say most of the data generated worldwide was using Illumina sequencing platforms. This is the NovaSeq I've shown here, but there's also smaller instruments like the MySeq. Uh, we did a lot of, the, of MySeq sequencing um, at my institute, OICR, when we were contributing to some of the Ontario genomes that are coming out. Um, the PacBio long read sequencer wasn't used very widely, but there were some uh, some genomes generated with the PAC file. Uh, but the Oxford Nanopore Minion was used uh, quite extensively, typically for countries that didn't have uh, a lot of genomics infrastructure at the start of the pandemic. The, the Minion is a really cheap, inexpensive device uh, to run. So a lot of countries that maybe couldn't have contributed to sort of the global surveillance of how uh, SARS CoV 2 was mutating and evolving over time, were able to use the Nanopore. Um, as their basis for their, their local sequencing projects. So these two technologies, Illumina and the Minion, were the main two that we focused on for uh, analyzing sequencing data. So here's sort of a, a high level uh, diagram of how the sequencing process works. We start from our sample. Uh, let's say there's a nasal swab here. You do uh, an RNA extraction. You then perform reverse transcription to uh, convert the RNA to cDNA. You then do these, this PCR reaction where we amplify the genome using two pools of PCR primers to get our, let's say in this case, 400 base pair amplicons. We then uh, pool the two, uh, two amplicon pools together, probably ligate barcodes on so we can do multiplexed sequencing, put it onto our sequencer of choice, uh, either the Illumina or the Minion, and then sequence it and get our sequencing 
uh, reads out. Um, I've shown just a, a little fragment of a, a, a sequencing read file here. This is called a FASTQ file. I'm not sure if you've been introduced to FASTQ before, but it's a standard way of representing sequencing data. Um, we'll look at some uh, FASTQ files for SARS-CoV-2 uh, a little bit later in the tutorial section uh, after this lecture. So the main, uh, the main point of this lecture is really to talk about the bioinformatics workflows. So once we've got these FASTQ files, um, we want to essentially reconstruct what the viral genome was. And in this case, we're gonna take a reference-based approach to reconstructing the viral genome. So we're not doing de novo assembly. What Gary talked to you about, we're using the reference information to try to determine what the sequence of some individual virus was that infected a person that that nasal swab was taken from. So there's really three main steps to, um, uh, to reconstructing that viral genome. We're gonna take the reads and align them to the reference genome. The reference genome is just a sample that was taken very early in the pandemic. Um, it was generated from one of the original uh, infections in Wuhan. It was sequenced around January, 2020. That became the basis of pretty much all SARS-CoV-2 uh, analysis subsequent to that, the release to that uh, initial genome. Uh, and we're going to use a program called BWA MAM to align the reads uh, to the reference genome. And I'm going to talk about that step uh, in just a little bit. And then we take the reads, see how they align to the reference genome, and determine where there's variance. And the definition of a variance in this context is just a position in our samples viral genome that differs from that reference genome. And then we're gonna take all of the variants and use that to generate a new virus genome, a consensus genome for the sample uh, using a tool called BCF tools. And the output of that is a FASTA file, which is our reconstruction uh, of the virus genome. Now, I just wanna make a point that this diagram is intentionally very, very simplified. It looks like we can just go from FASTQ to a, our analysis result in three steps, this BWA step, Freebase, and then BCF tools, which are all command line programs. In reality, though, there's a lot of other steps uh, that are real analysis pipeline that we're going to be working with in the tutorial uh, implement. We have to do things like removing human reads from the FASTQ file. So we don't want to release uh, any sort of information about the donor uh, that was uh, the sample was taken from. So we need to very, very stringently scrub out any sort of human information. We need to do things like uh, cutting off sequencing adapters. We need to uh, perform various steps of quality control. So while this little simple pipeline that I'm diagramming here has only three steps, a real pipeline that we're going to be using has probably 10 or 15 or even 20 steps. And we wouldn't want to sit on our command line terminal and run those 20 steps individually for every sample that we've sequenced. So we orchestrate these uh, complex analysis pipelines using a workflow language like SnakeMake or NextFlow. Um, and we're going to be working with a SnakeMake pipeline that Andrew MacArthur's lab developed uh, by a PhD student, Jay, Lee, uh, Jay Lees, uh, in collaboration with Finley McGuire, another one of the instructors uh, here today. And I also helped design some of the uh, tools that went into that SnakeMake pipeline. And I think one of the important things uh, that I want you to get out of this module is how these large scale analyses are orchestrated and how to work with these workflow languages like Snake Maker NextFlow that make it really easy to run complex analysis across lar uh, a large number of samples. Maybe I'll pause there. Any questions at this point about either the upfront sequencing or sort of the principles of analyzing uh, a genome from FASTQ file all the way to FASTA? All right, so uh, let's carry on. Um, so the first step of that analysis workflow is mapping reads to our reference genome. So especially when we're working with Illumina sequencing data, typically our reads are very, very short where our reference genome is much longer. Now, SARS-CoV-2 reference genome isn't very long. As I said, it's only about 30,000 nucleotides. Um, but our reads in, in the case of Illumina sequencing are much shorter, only about 100 to 200 nucleotides. So for every read, we need to figure out where it maps to or where it best matches to in our reference genome. 
Uh, and this is what we call the mapping and alignment step where we use uh, fairly sophisticated string algorithms to look up matches between our read sequence, which is shown this short little sequence in blue at the bottom, and our reference sequence, which is shown uh, in blue at the top. So what the mapping program is going to do is it's going to figure out where the highest identity sequence alignment between our read and our reference genome is. And in this case, it found this very nice alignment where there's seven bases that are exactly matched, and then one mismatch, which is a C to T mismatch, and then another seven bases that exactly match um, on the other side. Now, the read mappers need to be incredibly fast because they have to process millions or even billions of reads. So they're very, very highly optimized software. Uh, they can handle extremely large amounts, uh, large numbers of reads matching against uh, very long reference genomes, even up to the human reference genome, which is 3 billion bases. But at the end of this process, we get what's called a SAM or a BAM file, which describes how the reads uh, align to the reference genome that we input to the process. And we'll see examples of how to, to work with alignment data uh, a little bit later on. Now, once we have aligned all of our reads to our reference genome, we want to inspect every base of the reference genome to see whether all of the reads match that base of the reference genome or mismatch it. So in this case, if we're focusing on this middle T that I've highlighted here, we would create what we call a pileup of bases by finding the corresponding base in everyone, every single sequencing read that crosses that position of the reference genome. So we've got over 10 reads that all uh, align to this position of the reference genome, and they all have a T base in the genome, or sorry, in the read here. So in here, we'd say that this is unambiguously uh, a non-variant position where our reads all match the reference allele here. So we would put a T base into our consensus sequence. But if we look at another position, we're gonna see posi uh, situations where the reads disagree with what's in the reference genome. So here the read has a T again, but here all of the reads uh, have a C instead. So here we would say that this is a variant at this position or a mutation. Uh, because all of the reads agree that there's a C here where the reference genome had a T. So we would put a C into our consensus uh, sequence here. Now, other situations, it may not be so clear. So we might see situations where some of the reads match the reference at a T and other reads match, uh, mismatch the reference and have a C. And here we would annotate the genome not with either a T or a C, but to uh, represent the fact that this is ambiguous. We don't know whether there is a C here or a T. We would use what we call IUPAC ambiguity codes, which are special letters that stand for multiple possible bases. And in this case, the ambiguity code Y encodes for this base being either a C or a T. Now, uh, let's pull the class here. Um, Anybody want to suggest some explanations on why this might happen? Why we might have some reads with a T and other reads with a C? There's, there's many, many answers to this. Um, so let's see how many of them we can cover. Benjamin, yeah. Mixed infection. Mixed infection, that's a great one. So if there are two, uh, if, if, if the individual is unfortunate enough to be infected by two different versions of the virus, um, some that had a T at this position, others uh, one that had a T at this position, and others that had a C, we would see exactly this pattern of reads. Any others? Uh, Nico? Could it be that um, it's a coding region and sometimes the third nucleotide, even if it's slightly different, can code for the same protein? Yeah, so that, that's definitely possible. Like this could be a non-synonymous, or sorry, a synonymous mutation where uh, some of the, uh, you know, in, in DNA, there's a T or a C and it encodes for the same amino acid, but why would there be two different versions of, uh, of, of the, the genetic sequence, the, the RNA molecule in this case? Sam or Sam Lee? PCR error? PCR error, that's a great one. Um, we're going to talk about that exact case a little bit later where um, 
if you have samples with really, really low viral abundance, um, if you get first cycle PCR errors, that can give you a mixture of different bases. And this is an important quality control uh, measure that, that we used in Cancogen to de determine whether uh, genomes are high quality or not. So that's definitely uh, definitely a case. Yeah, Felicia? Quasi-species? Quasi-species is another one. There could be intra-host diversity. So these viral genomes are mutating. Um, there's definitely been, been cases in the literature where long-term infections and in, say immunocompromised people, the virus will diversify within the host and you'll see two different uh, alleles. Um, so that's, that's another great example. Any others? I can, I can think of one to two more. We've got a good list going here. I'll add one. So just sequencing errors. Um, the, the sequencing instruments aren't perfect. They make mistakes. They might uh, misidentify T's as C's or C's as T's. So this might be just errors intrinsic to sequencing. Um, I would make that a little different category than what, what Sam uh, suggested in PCR errors because we need to separate both categories. You can have errors in amplification, but you can also have errors that are intrinsic to the sequencing instruments themselves. This is particularly important when analyzing noisier type of sequencing data like nanopore sequencing, um, especially earlier nanopore uh, flow cells where the error rate was about five to 10%. And we had to take care that we weren't misidentifying sequencing errors as, uh, as variants or mutations. I can think of one other, one other good one, uh, one other good explanation. Um, maybe any, anybody else want to hazard a guess before I give my last, my last suggestion on how this can happen? All right, it looks like we've, uh, we, we've, we've come up with a good list, but uh, the last one I want to present um, is contamination. And this would be a little bit different than co-infections or intra-host diversity, but I mentioned that a lot of times we're multiplexing. We're going to sequence a lot of samples all in the same sequencing run. You typically prepare the sequencing data, uh, both with going through the Amplicon protocol, but also preparing the sequencing library on like a 96 well plates. There could be splash over between wells. There could be, you know, pipe heading errors when loading up the uh, the, the plate, and if you contaminate a, a, a well or a barcode with multiple different samples, you'll get exactly this pattern where there's positions in the genome that have multiple different possible bases. And this is a really important quality control criteria as we really, really don't want contaminated data to make it up into public databases or our uh, you know, our analysis results downstream. So we spent a lot of time in Cancogen trying to think about how to detect contaminated genomes and remove them or discard them from further analysis. But that was great. We got, we got to pretty much all the major uh, reasons on why we might have mixed bases. And we'll come back to this theme a number of times uh, over the next few hours. Okay, so the, the, the quick, the analysis pipeline that I sort of diagrammed earlier um, it was sort of a generic pipeline for any sort of whole genome sequencing data. Um, you know, we, we take our FASTQ files, we run them through BWA to align them to reference genome, we call variants, we generate a consensus sequence, and we have a fast, few, uh, a fast A output file with our consensus virus genome. Now, when we're dealing with Amplicon data, um, there's another really important step that we can't neglect, which is to trim primers from our reads. So whenever we amplify a segment of DNA, we're going to have our primers, which uh, initiate the, the, the amplification process. And those are essentially synthetic molecules that are always going to be the exact same sequence. And they're always going to match our reference genome. So they're not informative for determining if that, those positions of the genome are mutated or not. So whenever we analyze our reads, from Amplicon data, we need to make sure we identify where the PCR primers are and remove them to avoid calling uh, reference bases where there should be mutations or variants. And the reason I'm sort of going, uh, you know, expressing this so strongly is that there's been a lot of cases where 
data was not correctly primer trimmed. It got up into repositories like GenBank or GSAID. And then uh, it caused a lot of confusion when you're doing phylogenetics because those positions would look like reversions back to the reference allele and mess up a lot of the phylogenetic pipelines. So this is probably one of the most important steps that distinguishes processing applicant data from whole genome uh, shotgun data, uh, the need to very, very stringently uh, trim your, your, your PCR primers from your reads. All right, so here's just an example. This is some data that we're going to be looking at later on. Um, this is what a fast key, a record in a fast Q file looks like. We have an accession number, which is an identifier for the read. We've then got our sequencing read, which is just uh, A, C, Gs, and Ts. And then we've got a string, which is the quality of our sequencing data. Um, it's essentially the sequencing instrument's estimate of uh, how reliable each base uh, in the sequencing read is. Um, now I've highlighted in red here, the primer for one of the Arctic V3 amplicons. Um, and it's always, that segment of the read is always gonna identically match the reference genome. So we want to clip uh, that section of the read off. So we would just delete those first 20-ish bases and then the rest of the read would start from A, G, A, T, C, T, and so on. And that's the informative part of the read that actually tells us uh, what the sequence of the viral genome was um, in the sample that we took. So I think you've seen IGV so far, and we're gonna be playing with IGV a little bit later. Um, here's just an example of our reads before and after primer trimming. So in this case, we're looking at the very, very start of uh, the coronavirus genome, um, where the first amplicon starts from base 30 uh, of the virus. Um, but the first, say 15, 20 bases here, not informative. So after primer trimming, actually the first useful base is somewhere around position 55 here. So we don't get any information for the first, say 50-ish bases um, because the, uh, the, 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 the primer for the, the first amplicon starts at around uh, position 30 and after trimming uh, the useful information's after position 15. Okay, so that's some, um, that's the basics of how we analyze the data. The next part of the lecture is going to be all about quality control and how we uh, view the uh, sequencing data and try to determine whether our viruses were successfully assembled uh, and uh, useful for any sort of downstream analysis. But I'll just pause there to ask if there's uh, any questions about how we go from sequencing reads to uh, consensus genomes. Maybe while you're thinking of questions, I'll just make, uh, expand on a point I didn't get to. Um, I've been presenting this pipeline very much focused on Illumina data. So we're using BWA to map reach the reference genome. We're using Freebase to call variants. Um, the pipelines for other types of data like Nanopore or Bio, would be, be very similar in structure, but we would use different programs. Instead of using BWA to map read to reference genome, we'd probably use a program called Minimap2. And instead of using free basic all variants, we'd probably use Nanopolish or Claire3 or Madaka. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that the Workflow is pretty much the same. All the steps are the same, but you substitute in programs that are adapted to the type of sequencing data that you're working with. So you wouldn't want to use an Illumina variant caller on nanopore data or vice versa, because these variant callers typically are designed with the error model of the sequencer that you've used uh, built in. So you want to use a program that understands nanopore errors, analyze nanopore data, and vice versa for Illumina data. We're going to be working with Illumina data in the tutorial, um, but there's equivalent pipelines out there for nanopore data that would perform all of these steps for you using appropriate nanopore programs. Okay, so let's talk about quality control. Um, this was a big emphasis in Cancogen uh, because it was an incredibly large scale project. There were hundreds of thousands of genomes sequenced across Canada, and we need to make sure that a genome was equivalent in quality no matter where it was sequenced so that we could integrate the data into this national picture of how SARS-CoV-2 was mutating over the course of the pandemic. 
So we settled on really three different quality control criteria. Um, we're going to answer the question of whether the genome was successfully sequenced, uh, whether the genome is accurate, and this point I raised before, whether our sequencing run was contaminated or not. So I'm going to start by answering the question, was the genome successfully sequenced? And the reason this is important is that there are, uh, there's a lot of sample-to-sample -sample variance in the amount of virus that's present in the sample, how the sample might have been stored, or the method that was used to extract RNA. Um, and all of these things are can contribute to a differing ability to recover complete end-to-end -end consensus sequence. So the main way that we uh, quantify whether our sample was completely sequenced is by just looking at the read depth or the coverage of reads as a function of the position on the genome. Now, this is a, a, a very high quality sample where after sequencing, we had about a thousand reads cover every base of the genome on average. And that's easily sufficient coverage to figure out what the correct base is or what the consensus base was in the viral genome. So this would be a very, very easy sample uh, to analyze. And the way that we, uh, we think about the viral abundance is that we use the uh, measurements that the qPCR diagnostic test uh, generates as a proxy for viral abundance. So in this case, I've annotated the plot with the cycle threshold of the CT value from qPCR, the number of cycles that needed to be run to detect the virus. And this sample had a, a CT of 16, which is pretty low, and it means that there was uh, you know, probably quite a lot of viral RNA in the sample. So we would expect it to sequence very, very easily. This is a sample of a higher cycle threshold. So you needed to do more PCR to uh, detect the virus. And in this case, the coverage profile isn't so nice. We have these downward spikes here where there were very few reads covering uh, these positions of the genome. Um, these because we see these sort of dips over a region of the genome, this is because we're sequencing amplicons. So probably these amplicons just failed to generate at this position of the genome. Um, so we call these dropouts because the amplicon is just not seen in our sequencing data. And we wouldn't be able to detect if there were any variants or mutations at these corresponding regions uh, of the genome. So this is probably still a sample that's worth analyzing and using because most of the genome is covered, but we're gonna, not going to have some information in uh, these regions that were, that were dropped out. And here's an even more severe sample. This is a very high set, uh, CT sample of 34, where we have very, very poor amplification in genome. Some amplicons worked well, but the majority of bases wouldn't be covered. We probably wouldn't use this sample for downstream analysis just because it's a very fragmented, very partial genome. So the way that we quantify this is that we calculate the number of bases of the genome that had sufficient sequencing depth to make a reliable estimate of whether there was a mutation at that position. Um, and we, we uh, call this measure the genome completeness. Um, and the genome completeness is defined to be the proportion of the, the, the consensus genome that isn't an N character. So whenever there's a position in the genome that didn't have enough uh, sequencing coverage to estimate what the, the uh, base was at that position, it gets masked with an N in the consensus sequence. So we just count up the number of Ns in our sequence, divide by the length of the genome, that's the measure of genome completeness. So in this little toy example, the genome completeness would be 70%. In this example, it would be 90%. And in Cancogen, we set a uh, quality control minimum standard that the genome had to be 90% complete for it to be submitted into a, a public repository. So this process of estimating how many bases in the genome are missing was run on every single, every one of those, let's say 500,000 genomes, and unless it was greater than or equal to 90%, the genome was held back for submission into the uh, public repositories for the main reason that incomplete genomes are much harder to analyze. Um, it causes a lot of problems when you're trying to do a multiple sequence alignment to build a phylogenetic tree uh, like what uh, Fiona was talking about uh, yesterday. 
And early on in the project, we, we tried to work out the relationship between CT and the completeness of the genome. I think this is a plot that John Tyson with BCCDC made, um, where they did a lot of sequencing, not really selecting samples for, for having you know, high viral load, um, but across a whole range of different qPCR CT values. And we can see that after you have CT of about 30, the quality of the genomes quite drastically drops. And you have very, very fragmented genomes where, you know, once CT is above, say, 35, you're lucky to get about 50% of the genome successfully covered by reads. Now, it's kind of wasteful for sequencing resources to try to sequence these really high CT samples. Um, so early on, we, uh, we set a threshold um, that we'd only try to sequence things that were CT 30 or below. Now, different sites will have different, uh, you know, Q PCR machines, different QPR assays. So that boundary of what the upper limit of a sequenceable sample shifted depending on where you were sequencing. But sort of the most sites settled around this CT value of 30, um, where you wouldn't try to sequence the genome. Now, we can look at... Um, our genome coverage, not as a function of an individual genome, but across all samples uh, in a sequencing run. So this is a sample we did at OICR, and this is a figure put together by a uh, bioinformatician, my group, Richard de Borgia, where every row of this heat map is an individual sample, and every column is an amplicon. And the color of each one of these squares is how much sequencing data there was for that amplicon for that sample. So we can see some samples at the bottom here, which are all red, which means they're really, really low coverage. Uh, this is quite a good thing to see because these were the negative controls on our plate. Um, we'll talk about the role of negative controls a little bit. So we're happy to see that all of those negative controls had you know, very low coverage. We can also see some real samples like these ones that had a little bit lower coverage by this lighter color here, and these two that had a lighter color here. But we can also see inter-amplicon variation. So we can see that this amplicon here, this column, consistently had lower coverage across pretty much every sample, as did this amplicon and as did this amplicon. And this is one of the challenges of working with amplicon data, especially when the amplicons are very, very uh, highly multiplex and you have a lot of uh, different uh, primer pairs within a pool is that some amplicons will work, will work really, really well. Some amplicons won't amplify as efficiently. And that means that we need to sequence our samples to really, really high depth so that we make sure that these lower performing or these weaker amplicons are covered with enough reads that we're going to be able to estimate what the viral genome was in that region. So while we may only need 20x sequencing data, to calculate the consensus sequence for the viral genome, we may want to sequence each sample at 1,000x coverage to make sure that the, we, the amplicons that aren't performing as well um, are still covered with enough reads. And there was a ton of effort uh, from people like John Tyson and Josh Quick to try to balance the, piece, the primer concentrations in the amplicon pools to make sure that we have fairly uniform performance, but it's essentially impossible to get you know, completely balanced representation of every amplicon. So we ended up needing to sequence very, very deeply. And this sort of plot gets automatically generated by the analysis pipelines we're going to be working with um, so that we can assess whether there's problems with, you know, particular uh, primer pairs in our sequencing run um, or whether there's, you know, some dropouts caused by SNPs or things like that. Okay, so the, the second quality control measure that we might want to think about is whether our genome sequence is accurate. Um, so the idea that you know PCR uh, amplification can cause sequencing errors came up when we were talking about that mixed position. Um, and this is particularly problematic when you have low abundance samples where you know you may have early uh, early cycle PCR errors or just not enough data to estimate uh, an accurate consensus phase. So the way that we usually estimate or, or assess the uh, accuracy of our uh, genomes is by what we call this tree SNPs plot, where we take all of the genomes on our sequencing runs, so all the consensus sequences, again, as a uh, row in this plot, build a phylogenetic tree uh, from those uh, samples, and then plot where the variants are in every genome. 
So we can start to see some clear clustering uh, where s some viruses, like the one, these ones, this, this group, share a large number of SNPs, like at this position, this position, this position, and this position, and this position. So that probably suggests that they had a relatively recent common ancestor. And the fact that all of these positions agree gives us a, a pretty good indication that uh, you know, these, these sequences were reconstructed successfully. Similarly here, we see this group of sequences, which are characterized by this three base substitution towards the three prime end of the virus. Uh, and then we can see some subgrouping here where all of these uh, six viruses shared these three, uh, sorry, these uh, five SNPs here, 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 and here. So this plot just gives us a really quick way of visualizing the pattern of variation uh, across our samples. It also tells us where there's regions of the genome that weren't covered by reads, which is indicated by these gray bars here. So this stretch here means that within this consensus sequence, we didn't have any reads covering there. So we don't actually know whether, say, it had a SNP at this position, although we could probably infer that it didn't based on its placement in the phylogenetic tree. And uh, going back to this idea of early cycle PCR errors, um, we observed again early on in the project that the number of these mixed or ambiguous positions where there's evidence for two bases also increased as a function of our qPCR cycle threshold. So as CT increased, we had a higher load of those ambiguous or mixed bases. There's a few different theories on what causes this. It could be PCR errors. It could be reverse transcription errors. It also could be low level RNA edits um, of the viral genome that uh, end up affecting the consensus sequence when you have uh, you know, sequencing from low, low template or low abundance samples. So this was another reason that motivated why we only want to analyze samples with a cycle threshold of 30 or less, because the genomes would end up, if you sequence beyond that, they would have more ambiguous bases, more uncertainty of what the true genome is, and, uh, you know, cause a lot of problems for the downstream phylogenetics. So in our tree uh, SNP plot, we represent the mixed positions, these questionable positions we may not trust, and they may have one or two, uh, two or more possible alleles as black squares in the uh, boxes. And this is just a zoomed in version of four different genomes where this sample had five different bases that were mixed or ambiguous. And we set a QC criteria that if there is five or more of these positions, we would QC fail the sample uh, and discard it from further uh, analysis, again, to avoid causing any sort of problems downstream. Now, we, we came up with a lot of different theories on how these mixed positions can occur, you know, things like co-infections or things like intra-host diversity. If you suspect that this is happening, you may want to have, you know, a really close look to see if it's a low CT sample where you may might have expected it to, uh, to sequence cleanly to try to pull those out. But um, in general, we flag these samples for further review or outright QC fail if they had a lot of these mixed positions. Maybe I'll pause there and see if there's any questions. Yeah, Dinesh. Hi, yeah, I, I, go ahead, yeah. What's an ideal read depth? Uh, so, for example, uh, if you have 1,000 reads or 10 reads for generating a consensus. So, let's say you have, like, tiling amplicons, and for some of the amplicons, you have 1,000 reads, and some of them you have 10. How would you uh, uh, calculate the uh, coverage for the whole thing? Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, the analysis pipelines all have a minimum coverage uh, below which they won't generate a consensus base. They'll say that there's not enough information there. And for luminant data, the minimum coverage was 10 reads. For nanopore data, the minimum coverage was 20 reads. Okay. So ideally, we would have the genome covered by exactly, say, if we're doing nanopore sequencing, exactly 20 reads. And we would have you know, enough information to calculate a consensus sequence across the entire genome. But because some amplicons perform better than others, we need to over-sequence to make sure that the lowest coverage amplicon 
has 20 reads. So we typically targeted around 1,000x coverage or maybe even 500x coverage to make sure that those lower, lower uh, performing amplicons still met our threshold for calling a consensus base. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's a trade-off between you know, the amount of sequencing data you're willing to generate per sample and how complete your genomes are. Now, the SARS-CoV-2, it's a very small genome. It's only 30,000 bases. And, you know, modern sequencers generate enormous amounts of data. So we're typically not limited by, you know, raw sequencing coverage. Um, so we can easily generate, you know, 1,000x or more. I think COG UK, which we're going to be using data from COG UK, this is the UK's national sequencing project. Um, they sequence routinely to like 10,000x, 20,000x, or even greater to make sure that the samples were... Uh, you know, really, really well covered. But the minimum is, is about 20 X. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And the last QC criteria I'm going to discuss is whether, uh, you know, our sequencing run is contaminated. So as I mentioned, see, our sequencing protocols are highly multiplex. We have a lot of samples going on. Um, you know, there's a lot of amplification the, to, to generate the Arctic amplicons I don't know what the, the PCR protocol was. There's many, many cycles uh, of amplification. So even if there's little bits of cross-contamination across a plate, it can generate a de detectable signal, um, which is why you know, the, the sequencing labs had to be so careful about making sure they were very, very clean, making sure they're cleaning up after you know, every individual run to avoid contaminating subsequent runs with ample cons from previous runs. So by far the best way of assessing if there's contamination is just the use of negative controls. You leave, say, a water blank or even an extraction blank in one well of your plate, take that negative control all the way through the library prep and sequencing process, and then see whether you get any reads mapping to the genome. And the QC package we're going to be working with automatically would assess the coverage in the negative control samples on the sequencing run and fail the entire sequencing run if there was too much coverage in the negative control. This is an example of uh, a, a run, I believe it was at OICR, where we see these five different towers of coverage all corresponding to one Arctic amplicon, um, where each one of these amplicons was almost a thousand X sequencing coverage. So because this, uh, this negative control was contaminated by five amplicons, we would discard this entire sequencing run. Um, genome directors didn't always like this. Um, they would try to see if we could rescue the runs in various ways, but the safe policy was just to outright discard the run, resequence, reprocess, and resequence that plate. Um, we did have some tolerance for, you know, if there's one amplicon that was present in the negative control, we wouldn't trigger an outright fail, but we might discard that region from all genomes on the plate to try to avoid, uh, you know, having to resequence uh, if there was if there was a problem with just one amplicon. Another way we can assess uh, individual samples that are contaminated is look for samples that have evidence of mixed bases that correspond to, to different samples that are on the same sequencing run. So in this sample, which I'm calling sample C here, there's this mixed position indicated by a black square, which corresponds to the preference of the reference allele that's in sample B and the variant allele, which is in sample A. And this position here, which is mixed, corresponds to variants that are in sample B and reference alleles in sample A. So be, by the pattern of mixed bases in this sequence, we can pretty confidently say that there's an admixture between some sample A and some sample B in the well that we called sample B, uh, C. And we would discard this sample because it gives us very clear evidence that there was, um, that there, there was, this sample was indeed contaminated. Again, you'd probably want to flag this and investigate it further to see if it was in fact a co-infection, um, but generally these were pipetting errors where there's just a bit of two samples in one well, um, and we wouldn't be able to resolve that or work with it, so we would flag sample C for reprocessing uh, on another plate. Okay, um, 
this slide says we're on a coffee break. We're not actually. I think we're going to go straight into uh, the tutorial. Um, I'll pause here. So this was all about you know how we do co uh, quality control on SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. I think it generalizes to other viruses and other pathogens that you're, you might be interested in. Um, but I'll just pause here and ask if there's any questions about the lecture material before we go into some hands-on work. 